Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Alien vs. Predator Galaxy podcast. I'm usual host, Aaron Percival, and joining me is my regular partner in crime. Bridgetop, or Adam Zeller. Hey, everyone. And this is episode 116. Now, we've had a few months of Predator stuff. I promised we'd start going back to Alien. Um, as of recording, we've literally just released our review episode of the Alien role-playing game. And so for this episode, we have a returning guest who appeared probably about three years ago, actually. Um, I've made him wait a long time to come back on because I'm cruel <laughs> and evil. But it's because he, you know, had such a hand in this awesome role-playing game that we, we've had him back on to tell us all about what it's like working as um, working as writing on, on a role-playing game for Alien. So welcome back to the show, Mr. Andrew Gasker. Yeah, well, hey, dude. thanks. It's great to be here. Um, you didn't have me back because I caused such a ruckus last time. You told me I was never going to be on your show again. So I really appreciate <laughs> you changing your mind. <laughs> well, we, we went we went to video as well this year, and I was just... <laughs> I was concerned about any complaints if you showed up without trousers <laughs> or pants, I guess. Sorry. For 12 hours, I practiced that for 12 <laughs> hours. <laughs> oh, man, I, I, I was rolling at the end of it. Tell the story. Tell the story so it doesn't sound like I'm being a perv. Um, <laughs> I mean, you are, but uh, no, the um, so the Gen Con uh, any awards. Um, all the finalists were asked to record pre-recorded video. We weren't told who was winning, but you know they got finalist videos from everybody so that they had them ready to go. Um, and uh, I got hit with it from Thomas. Like, technically, I think it was after the due date because because he sent me this email. He's like, "Hey, so they extended this to Wednesday. Uh, do you want to do the video? Because I mean, it'd be great if you did it." I'm like. So I've got a day. Okay. <laughs> so I just spent, spent like 12 hours practicing saying my little bit without going um and ah uh, and, and getting up and walking away and showing that I had no pants on because of the pandemic. Because uh, everybody's doing the waist up on the videos. So yeah, <laughs> 12 hours, my cat kept looking at me like, why are we doing this again? <laughs> so. Oh, man. I loved it. I was sat there, well, why is why is this still going on? <laughs> and then you got up and walked to us like, oh, this is brilliant. Fair play. Fair play, afraid, Drew. I was afraid that they were going to think that it ended and I forgot to turn it off and they were going to turn it off before we even got there. So uh, it, it worked out. I don't think they even watched it before they played it because the reaction <laughs> of the, the judges was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. So, yeah, we're talking the role-playing game, which, as Drew has just mentioned, um, won at least one award. It won several friggin' awards, and it's done really well in, in, in terms of that kind of thing, which has been cool. Very well-deserved as, as, um, as far as we're concerned, as far as the awarding bodies are concerned, and certainly as far as a, a lot of the players uh, who I've seen online are concerned. Very well-deserved, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Oh, yeah, I have I have friends that that are in into like D and D, and they're not really even Alien fans, and they've been picking it up. <clears throat> that's and interesting. I'm surprised. I'm like, you're playing this game, really? So, see that that's really interesting to me because the initial response that we were hearing in all the groups on Facebook was that players who normally play Dungeons and Dragons didn't want anything to do with this game as soon as they sat down at the table because they're like, what my characters dead I'm, I'm missing an arm already i mean what, what you know, <laughs> they wanted to be the superheroes that they are in dungeons and dragons you know mm -hmm. um but people that were more into call of cthulhu and stuff like that were enjoying alien so i i, I like that I, I like to hear what you're saying because it's like it means that people are, are are getting around to this other way of thinking about it too and i love dungeons and dragons i played D, &D for over 20 years actually i didn't play i probably phrase that i game mastered for over 20 years so um you know it, it, it's just i like the Alien definitely gives you something that that doesn't. So it's it's great to, you know, have have a hobby that you love and being able to do something different in it. So. Definitely. Now, Adam, do you want to kick us off then before he starts, yep. you know, revealing all the things we've got um, to ask him about in questions? Yeah. So you've written novels and comics for many different franchises. You've written internal franchise bibles and timelines for film studios, but Alien was the first RPG you've written for. 
Before we get into the nerdy nitty gritty, I'd first just like to ask you how familiar you were with RPGs overall, and you've already kind of gotten into this. Uh, so you had a fairly extensive past with DMing in Dungeons and Dragons, then. Yeah, um, I, 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 I actually have barely. I, I played BattleTech and Star Trek more than I've ever played Dungeons and Dragons. But I started Dungeons and Dragons when I was 11, I think. Uh, all my friends were playing it. My mom got me the the red box set, which is the basic game back then. And uh, I was never invited to the parties for the for Dungeons and Dragons. So I was like, I got it now. I, I'm coming to play. And they're like, all right, fine. I go with the character sheet, and they're like. Ah, this is basic. We play advanced Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> so they marked all this shit up on my character sheet. Oh, can I say? Yeah, yeah. Explicit. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and we played, and I think they all hated each other because, like, within five minutes of playing the game, they were all ready to kill each other. Like the characters, <laughs> like someone someone didn't pass the chips, so this other guy was going to cut his head off for it. You know what I mean? It's like, and it, it devolved, and they were all like several la- levels higher than my character. And so it devolved into this chaos, and my, I so my character, I, I said, I said, I just back up into the shadows, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I left. I was like, you know, it ended in chaos, and like I, I, I said before it left, I was like, my character's getting out of there. So the game master played one session separately with me after that to get me the hell out of it. It was the Temple of Elemental Evil, which is a really tough place to be for a first level character. You shouldn't be there at all. Got me out of it, and then I decided, you know what? I don't know if I want to play this. I think I want to game master this. And that was the, like the last time I played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and I, that character became my main uh, NPC that I put in all the adventures instead. And uh, yeah, for tw- over 20 years, I, I game mastered. So, so when, when you say you played Star Trek, was it the old FASA one? Or do you mean the yes. new Star Trek? Okay. The, uh, the FASA one. Unfortunately, I haven't, um, up until Alien, I haven't played, I haven't role played probably in maybe a decade even. Um, you've, and you've only just got around to Alien, haven't you? Wasn't that the Gen Con? Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the uh, UK Game Expo. Oh, was it UK Games Expo? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. You're right. You're right. No, at Gen Con last year, I played for the first. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, in the playtesting at Gen Con in, in 2019, I, I, uh, I sat in on that. And then I played online for the first time with the UK Game Expo. Yeah. So, yeah. So, no, um, it's, uh, it's refreshing to be a player. After decades, <laughs> you know, so um, getting a taste of your own medicine. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I have a, a never anything professional, um, but I, I've loved role playing, you know, since I was a kid. So yeah, always Are been. You've GM'd. It. You've GM'd the new game as well, right? The Alien one. Nope. No. Oh. Nope. Nope. I don't want to GM it. I refuse to GM it. Oh. Is that purely because of? You know how much work you've gone into, you, you've put into making it. You know you don't want to. It's like I worked, um, I worked for Ro- uh, Rockstar Games uh, for 17 years, uh, working on things like Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption and stuff like that. And before I started working for them, I was huge into video games. And then I started working for a video game company. And when it becomes your 14 to 16 hour day of work. The last thing you want to do on your break is play a video game. So that's what it's like now. I'm pouring so much work into this alien thing. I don't want to run it after I've written it. I'd rather play something that someone else has written. You know, I'd rather I'd rather feel that experience because I feel like that's going to give me something more to know what to do with it when I when I write the next one. You know, okay. yeah. Yeah. what's it like from the other side? Um, and it's just fun getting lost in it that way and you know uh i was kind of screwing with dave when we were playing with the uk uh game expo uh uh dave dave semark 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 i can never say his Samark. name uh, yeah he's gonna yeah. give me crap for this he's gonna give me crap for this i always say his name wrong but you know what i'm talking about and he does too from the effect podcast yeah yes hi dave uh <laughs> you know i was purposely doing things that was that that the other players weren't Taking myself out of it and 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 putting myself around just to see just to see what happens. How much does this throw it off the trail and stuff like that? And, and he handled it great. You know, he, he totally did. But it, that and that's one of the things I try to do when I write my adventures. Is I think, okay, what's the most 
ridiculous, dumb thing that a player is going to think to do. And I'm going to put an answer for that in this. <laughs> because because I, I've seen so many, um, you know, GMs, including myself, when they're running a pre-published adventure, suddenly you get to this thing and your players want to do, they, everybody has to go east. Well, they're going west. And you're like, uh, <laughs> I, I need to make them regret going that way so they go the way I want them to, you know? So I, I try to think that stuff in. And then funny, some of the things that I put in originally, Dave was like, yeah, they're not going to try to steal the ship in the first act. So why is this here? <laughs> I was like, all right, I overthought it in some places. <laughs> so, you know, so he he uh, he was checking my work, so to speak, because he was running the play test stuff when I was writing it. So yeah. I'm destroyed. So yeah, so it's uh, it's good to have both sides. But the, the short answer is. <laughs> so, the Free League RPG isn't actually the first alien RPG that's come around. Um, I think it was uh, late eighties, um, Leading 90, Edge. Ninety one. Ninety one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Leading Edge brought out an aliens RPG. Um, were you familiar with that before working with Free League on this new um, iteration? I bought my copy in 1991. So. Oh. oh, man. <laughs> so I never old. played it. So I never... old, Drew. <laughs> yeah, I know. I never played it because the rules were, like, ridiculously tough. It's like, it's there's just, there's just, I don't know. I could never find a flow enough to want to run it as a campaign. But I read that book, I don't know how many times. So I wanted to use as much of it as I could um in the new game but there were some things that were just impossible to use like it, it just I, some weird thoughts they had in there like the united states colonial marines belong to the icc or something like that it, it was they had, they had all this weird stuff instead of like they have an american flag on their uniforms you know so it, I, I had to change things like that to make it fit more with the canon but i tried to preserve the planets as much as possible and things like that. And obviously there's things they said about the alien, which we know just simply aren't true now. So I removed that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Was that any sort of like... I assume it wasn't something that came from, from Free League, you know, let's let's pay homage to these guys, but purely, you know, from your side of, of, of loving the old, or at least reading through it. Yeah, I, I mean, I worked in as much things as possible from all the sources because I wanted to be respectful of everything that came before. Um, so yeah, no, that I, I don't, I honestly, I never asked Thomas. I don't even know if you know, know if he knows <laughs> that there was a leading edge role playing. I'm sure he does now, but he, I don't think he may have known originally, you know? So, Fair enough. um, yeah. Okay, yeah. I've been, as far as the rules are concerned, I've been just surprised at how accessible it is to, to people who haven't really played RPGs before. Like my tabletop experience was very limited and not to, to pen and paper at all. I had never played Dungeons and Dragons or anything of that sort before this. And I, I mean, there was a little bit of a learning curve, but it, it was pretty easy for me to get into and, and our GM explain things to me. And, you know, the, the rules are not overly complicated. They're, they're pretty accessible. That's, that's all Thomas. Um, that's, that's, that's his rule system. Um, in regards to making rules, I, I've I've never written I've never written a rule that's been published. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, okay, so it should be this, this, and this. And Thomas gets it and he's like, I'll rework it. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually then before we get on, yeah. um because I, I I'm apparently shit in my job and I completely failed to um introduce you properly in terms of in terms of that. Can you explain to people your involvement with the RPG as um, the writer. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I'm I'm lead writer of the game. Um, what that means is I'm writing the settings, the tone, and uh, although I wasn't originally going to, I'm the adventure writer, and luckily that seems to be paying off as well. Um, the uh, so anything that's not rules is written by me. In most, in ninety nine percent of the cases that are in the books, I think uh, Hope's Last Day is written by Dave, not me. Um, so, but most of the stuff is written by me. That is not specifically crunching stats or telling you how to how to get a talent or any of that. So, all that stuff is Thomas. So, it, it's it's a collaborative effort. The game, um, you know, I, I'm not just the sole writer or everything. Yeah. Did did you spruce up any of the sort of 
detail. I don't really know how to describe or explain this. So, even even though you didn't write the mechanics as such, I felt there was there was phrasing and, and explanations of the mechanics that felt like you had been writing them. You know, just sort of like flavor to it. Did did you have any involvement in sort of like wording the rules for Alien fans and, and keeping that? feeling and that theme in there when when i first wrote the first chapter of the book i didn't i honestly didn't know where i was going to go with it right and it was just an introduction to the universe and then that whole that whole first paragraph that they put on the back of the book also in the end about space as hell mm -hmm. um when i wrote that it set the tone of how we were going to do the whole book so thomas will send me something he's like can you can you make this sound can you make you sound more sexy? <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing. So yeah. little things like that. There's little places like that throughout the text. Um, but, you know, um, where I, I just did something to punch it up, like talking about putting somebody in your trunk of your car, the alien in the trunk of the car. Do you know what I'm talking about? There, there's a uh, little things like that. I put that in there. Um, but the um, in regards to how the mechanics work, I said to them in the beginning, and I don't even know what their plans were, so they may have had stuff like this covered already. But I said in the beginning, I sent them a list. I was like, I think we need to have a rule for, uh, I didn't call it the stress mechanic. I called it uh, for uh, post-traumatic post stress disorder. I said, we need to have something for that because if these characters are going to keep surviving, they have to get messed up from it, you know? Uh -huh. um, and, and so little, and, and, and I said, I think the alien needs to be as deadly as it was in the first movie, not, not cannon fodder, but like, the warriors are in, in the second one. I mean, in, a, in, in as much as I love the second movie, there's a there's a, such a unbalance between the two in regards to how the aliens are. Um, and it's like one of the things that I wanted to, like we made the pulse rifles, their armor piercing rounds, obviously they say it in the, you know, so if you got a pulse rifle, you got to stand, you stand a much better chance than if, you, if you're, you know, sitting there with a, um, a, a cattle prod. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm you know what I'm saying, but but it's like I wanted. I, there was a little things I think really think that we should handle this like that. I gave them this whole list. I don't know if, for all I know, 99% of that they already had on their table, so I don't know how much that affected the rules. Fair enough. Okay. And we mentioned earlier that you wrote internal bibles and timelines for film studios, two such being Alien and Predator. How did you go from writing those internal guides for 20th Century Studios to? writing the alien RPG, did one kind of feed into the other? Yeah, I, um, I had developed a really good relationship with, uh, with Fox in regards to working on the Bible stuff. And I was told that if there's a publishing project that, um, if, there's, if, there's some, if there's some category that's not taken right now, and I can find a publisher that's interested, then they, if if they're gonna if I'm gonna be working on it, they'll totally be into it, okay. And so I went to Joe Lafavi uh, from Genuine Entertainment. He's he's my best friend. He um, he makes things like this happen pretty much. And he freely had already been on his radar. And so he went to Thomas and it was like, hey, you guys want Alien? And apparently Thomas had a short list of wish list things of that he would love to have something to do with one day and alien was at the top of the list huh. so it's like all these things just came together and it all the line kind of yeah. thing yeah so I, I i don't even know if thomas knows that i i i talked to joe um to try and find you know i said joe see if you can find some work for this because we could totally do it but i don't even know if thomas knows that he just knows that joe came to him um but it's uh it's great because the, the, all three of us really care about the franchise and so many franchises are plagued by a company saying hey we could probably make some money off of this let's go offer the studio all this money so they'll give it to us and then we'll try and figure out what we want to do i don't know what we're going to do I, uh hire my cousin to write it you know, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. it's like or, or hey that guy's a big name who doesn't care anything about alien but he's a big name use him it's 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 these people all involved care about this product and that's really great synergy to have on uh, a franchise product so, and i think obviously the fans are seeing it um since it's doing so well so. definitely i mean even down to the artists you know um 
I knew I knew one of those guys before, <clears throat> you know, before he was working on the book, and I knew how much um, um, how much he was really into the series as well. So you know, it it goes out to corners of of the project. Mm-hmm. which is great oh, the art is fantastic i would love if they release just like an art book that's just the art in like big panels yeah I, i'm sure i'm sure that would do well um yeah martin grip's art is amazing yeah so you've got all this existing alien knowledge in your brain because of the bible and the timelines but what's the first step for putting it to use right in the law, right in the world, right in the setting for the RPG. Where's, I mean, because so much of it is just, here's a load of stuff, do as you will with it for the, for the GM and, um, right. you know what, um, you know what I mean? But, but where's the first place that you started with the game at when, when you sit down to put it together, all this stuff bubbling in the back of your brain, where do you start? I made a list um, and this was bef- this was like two years before uh, I talked to Joe and Joe got Free League involved. I made a list of if I was going to do an alien role playing game, what are my favorite things from this franchise? And I I had that list, um, and some of the Kenner aliens are on it. You know, it's like it's from it's from everything. And I decided that you know I, I want to work these things in. If I, if I get to do an alien novel or I get to do uh, an alien role playing game or whatever I get to do alien, I want to try and work these things in first. Um, <clears throat> so it's really just about moments that hit me. And I really got fascinated like um, reading the, the other versions of Alien 3. And I don't just mean uh, Gibson's. Uh, Vincent Ward's version was fantastically weird. Um, it was not something, not the way I would have gone with it if I was writing it, but it, you know, it's like the, the wooden planet thing and everything, but it's like, it's so weird and it, it's, it's, it's a really cool con- concept and you could do something really great with it. And I was like, I'm going to put all this stuff in, um, the, I guess what, if we backpack pedal on that, the answer to the question that what started all this probably, I would say is the West end games, uh, star Wars role playing game that came out in the late eighties, early nineties. Because that game wound up becoming the Bible that they gave to the novelists um, who wrote the Star Wars novels. It's like right. Timothy Zahn was the first one. He's like, it's like, what are they? What are, what are we calling these guns? And Lucasfilm's like, I don't know. Here, take this role playing book. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the role playing book not only did that influence the future stuff, but the role playing book made vehicles based on the concept art that Ralph McQuarrie did that was never used and stuff like that. So they went before and after uh in in what they created there and i was like that's definitely what i want to do with this i want to draw upon the unused sources draw upon the existing material and hopefully create a book that becomes in the new material of books moving forward so Hmm. well that's actually something we've commented on as well i mean even even if people aren't necessarily interested in playing the game as a game it's a it's a fantastic resource for um in narrative elements and and just getting an, an information uh, um a background on on the possibility of the world and stuff like that so i think you've got there i think that's perfectly uh that's been achieved awesome with this one. when we had you on the show last it was to talk about prometheus and it wasn't a film we were all terribly big on but the rpg itself leans very heavily into elements of the prequels uh that they introduced uh, which is great from a gameplay variety perspective, but as someone with personal preferences, did you find it difficult to play into the prequel angle? I think my, I, I, well, I mean, I, I never hated Prometheus. Um, I think I was saying a lot of things in defense of it when we were on last time, if I remember correctly, I don't know. But regardless, I, I think I have a greater appreciation for it now than I did before. Um, and part of that is because of the deleted scenes when you watch all the deleted scenes and um, the story makes the sense that it, it needed to, I think it, I, I, I wish those parts hadn't been cut out because I think it gives a, a lot more to it. And the best thing that Prometheus does is broaden the horizons of the universe so much. Um, it's not just about this one creature anymore. And, you know, uh, Ridley himself has said the, the, uh, the, 
bird is cooked, I think is what how he says it. Uh, the, the beast to, is cooked. The beast is cooked. There you go. The beast is cooked. Um, in some ways, I think he's right. In other ways, in other ways, I still see you know possibilities of where to go with it. Um, but it's like there's just so much in that Prometheus backstory that allows you to go down different avenues in this game. And and that's one of the things I, I started to think about. If and in fact, this is actually one of the things we saw people worried about when the game was announced. They were like, "Well, an alien role-playing game." I mean, okay, so oh, you go around the corner and there's an alien again. You know, that's what people were afraid it was going to be like. And I was like, "No, there's a rich universe here that you can play with, and you don't even have to have the aliens show up." Uh, so when I write anything for it, my guideline is. It has to be alien, meaning strange and different from what we know. It doesn't need to be the alien. So whether that means a, a, you're investigating some weird ruins of something, or you're on a planet where the atmosphere works differently, or, or something, no matter what, there's going to be something that's weird and alien in there. And that's, that's I think, the best way to carry a campaign. Um, because you're always going to want the alien itself to show up at some point. But if the alien is, itself is around every single corner throughout every game, you're, it's going to become boring eventually. So that I, I agree with you. That's that was something I, while I had a problem with some of the stuff the film was doing as an overall package, I always thought it, it was a brilliant opportunity for the expanded universe to to well, expand even more outside of the alien. You know, it's it's this. Uh, avenue towards gigares things that aren't necessarily the alien with the cattle a um so yeah, even even if i'm not necessarily a big fan of of prometheus itself um it was one of the things i was actually quite pleased to see you embrace with um you know with, with, with the rpg even things like um you sort of nod towards the fan hope <laughs> i suppose that it is that the engineers and the space jockeys aren't necessarily the same thing right no, I, yeah. I mean, personally, as a fan, I would like to think they're not the same thing. But I have to look at this in both ways. I have to look at this as, you know, a uh, canon consultant slash game writer uh, and also as a fan. So that, that's, that is a good way to explain how I put a lot of the stuff in there that's from the, the older stuff from the 90s as well. Um, <clears throat> If we've thought about it a certain way, but now it seems to be a different way, when you think about it, David is an unreliable source. So if he actually said he created the alien, did he though? Do we, we really hope, know? We hope not. <laughs> well, Al Alan Dean Foster kind of did the same thing with the novel there. So Right, right. Um, and I was happy to see Alan did that. And once, once I saw Alan had done that and wasn't shot down for doing it, I was like, oh, okay. There's room here, and and that's where I specifically did. That's why. That's even why um, uh, uh, I put hints in there about Gibson's Alien Three, because there's so many people. And while I totally disagree with this, because I love Alien Three as it came out, I love the I love the assembly cut uh, or special edition, whatever the the latest cleaned up version is. I love that one so much more. Um, but at the same time. There's so many people like, oh, I wish Hicks and Newt hadn't been killed. I wish they'd gone with the Gibson thing. And the Gibson audio drama was was fantastic. The, yeah. Um, yeah, with, it was. Uh, uh, Hicks and Bishop, it was just great. So um, I was like, well, whether or not, okay, in canon, Alien 3, she's on the prison planet. That's what happened there. That doesn't mean that something else didn't happen on Anchor Point Station that caused it to blow up. Is it the same thing? Or you know, uh, you got to pick which one you want to be real and which one to be the rumor. Uh, I think when it when it yeah when it comes down to it, these universes just get so vast and complex that eventually some head canon is going to have to be involved for fans. Something we found really interesting with lore in the book was how you'd brought in a lot more than just the expanded universe in the, the books and comics. You also brought in elements of the unused scripts with the union of progressive peoples from Gibson a Gibson's Alien 3 and even referenced an original anchor point before building oh. a second station. And then there's the um, 
Arceon Station from Vincent Ward's Alien 3. Can you tell us a little more about your efforts in reconciling those kinds of elements and your really interesting quote-unquote barroom stories philosophy and how that relates to this? That's, that's exactly where I was just going to yeah, go in. You were already kind of alluding yeah, yeah, to that, yeah. 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 Um, so the, the um, there's always stories. There's stories we love that can't possibly be canon if you're going to consider the films canon. And as far as I'm concerned, the films have to be canon. Um, I personally don't like, and Clara Feifei Fei is going to hate me for saying this, I don't like Alien Resurrection very much. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't so, fault you. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like it doesn't, it doesn't match the tone of anything with the rest of the franchise. Um, I know what they were going for. I know why things happened the way they did. I, it's still just not my favorite. But there's some cool things in it. Um, which I have, like, uh, you know, they mentioned that uh, the, the Betty uh, is is over 200 years old in in the movie. So, um, you know, she's a relatively new ship. That type of ship is a relatively new ship in the role-playing game, because that would work, you know. Um, but the when it's not the film, especially, um, there are some alien stories that I read in the 80s and 90s that I thought were fantastic, which can't possibly be canon anymore. Um, <clears throat> but they were so cool. And there's going to be someone out there who, to them, well, that's my canon, okay? And this is a game where you're creating the universe and using this as a guide. So the idea of the barroom discussions is that comic that you love, the planet from it, the maybe the creature from it, maybe whatever maybe the characters that were in it, they all exist in this universe. This, the, the comic you read, the story in there, maybe just some drunken conversation at a bar that someone overheard about what really happened with those people. Mm. So, you know, looking at it that way, anybody's headcanon can work. Because you can say, okay, that was a barroom discussion. This one wasn't. In my campaign, this it's Gibson and not, not the uh, Fincher. You know, so it... it I wanted to give you freedom like that because there so many fans have their idea of this has to be like this. And at the end of the day, the real canon is honestly whatever Fox decides it is. Uh, it's, it's, and, and I want to stress the fact that because um, I want to stress the fact that my title over there was consultant. I never set any canon. You know, there were things that I, I looked at the products that they had and I thought, okay, so this would make sense if this was here, so you could make this canon. And they approved it or didn't, you know. And then when I wrote the game, the game gets approved. They, they Every time we send something in, we um, have to send in a report explaining, so this, this, this came from this, this is where this comes from, this is, uh, you know, this is this previously published thing. This was mentioned in this movie. This is from concept arc. And you got to give them that report. And they're like, oh, okay. Because it all exists already. You know, um, so there's things I extrapolate are coming out of what exists. And I think that's something important to do when you're working in a franchise is, yeah, you need new ideas injected in there. But those new ideas should be, you know, there's this and this. Why wasn't it ever done this? It shouldn't be, well, I'm going to bring my completely unrelated thing into this and try and jam it in here. You know, it, 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 the universe suggests things. So find your new stories in those suggestions is the way I look at franchises. Yeah, personally, and that's why I was really excited for Blomkamp's Alien 5 when, when it still looked like that was going to be a thing, was because this would be the first time where there would just be alternate continuities in the world of alien and it would kind of be more like the novels and comics where there's different ones and it's up to you to kind of mix and match them how how you prefer them yeah my as much as i wanted to see that movie because the idea of having ripley and hicks and everyone together again is amazing um at the same time i feel like that if the films are going to do that it's going to muddy it up a little bit um, I would rather see novels or, or audio dramas or video games do alternate ideas than I would yeah. rather see the films. Um, and, and that may be more appropriate, yeah. But, um, 
Go, go ahead. What? I was gonna. I was gonna say. I, I agree with you in terms of that. I, you know, Hicks is my favorite character. He's who my. I alias... never would have gotten that. Ah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's who I named my alias after. And as much as I would have liked to have seen him back on the big screen, and as much as canon doesn't affect me, mm. I would have. not I would not have liked split continuities because it's not. This isn't Star Trek where um, right. an alternate timeline and and you know going back in in time is a genius way of rebooting um, something, even if the writing itself is not. Yeah, that See, that's the, what's what's interesting about that in particular <clears throat> is that when I was first looking at the Alien timeline as a consultant for Fox. Um, I was told uh, if Bloomkamp does Alien 5, it looks like they're going to erase 3. But how can we not erase 3 and still have Alien 5? And I was like, you want me to figure that out for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Blomkamp himself was saying, like, I don't want to erase 3 and 4. This is just a different thing. So, and yeah, I mean, it does get pretty muddy. You look at the Terminator franchise, like what they did with Dark Fate and, and Again, Genesis. And that, it's like, that franchise supports that idea. Because it's time times. travel. Yeah. yeah it's time, so. travel. time travel, you're good. Yeah. And, and so that's what I, I mean. At that point, we were talking about AVP being part of the same universe as well. Um, Fox later decided, and I'm thankful that they did, that there are three universes there's the Predator universe. Yeah the alien slash Prometheus universe, and then there's the AVP universe. Yeah. And they're not connected. And um, some, fan, some fans do argue that Predator and AVP are connected because there's enough cross-references there. And, and Shane Black said in the lead-up to The Predator as well, you know, he counted the AVPs in among those Predator films when he was talking about them. That's interesting. Because, that's he, interesting didn't, because... he didn't like the concepts. Well, we because we were we because what we were the mandate was that from from the guys up top, which would mean Ridley and and Shane, that um that it should be separate. Um, but now that you're saying that, the Predator I think works better as an AVP movie. Than it does as a... <laughs> well, I mean they they literally filmed uh, Ripley and and an uh, older Newt showing up, and I it's like, how could you that. do that without time travel? That that I have got have, to all be John have, Davis, surely. I have a theory about that. I think that was just bait and switch. I think that stuff. I mean, look, there were no real actors. You didn't have Sigourney Weaver showing up. You didn't have the woman who played Newt, you know, thirty years ago showing up. You couldn't even see their faces. I think that they were trying to get. Arnold or someone to do a surprise ending and they're like let's film a whole bunch of BS endings <laughs> <laughs> so that if something leaks that's what leaks oh, man. that's my theory because it takes two seconds to shoot that do you know what I mean it's like they had the pod once they had the pod and the the face hugger mask all right hey, hey, let's, let's do it like, let's take that suit off of you and put the newt suit on instead you know it, it just <laughs> seems like it was it was like let's keep them guessing let's keep them guessing that that's my theory I have no proof of this um, and if, if, if that is what happened, it's pretty genius, actually, because Arnold Arnold's going to be at the end of Predator. That's the surprise. OK, what? Ripley in a time machine? What? What are you talking about? Now, that's <laughs> going to be the one that everyone's going to talk about and, and be surprised that Arnold shows up. You, yeah. you know what I mean? It, that, that, that's my theory. I don't I don't know if I would ever want time travel to be an element. I mean, they kind of hinted at it at the end of uh, Life and Death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that was the only time uh, we've really seen it in the comics. Not uh, just. <sighs> it's, it's it's possible depending on what the engineers' ships, how they travel, what their drive does. Because I had a theory about this too, that if they wind up telling us it was David, couldn't some engine accident <laughs> <laughs> put David? <laughs> But this is why that, there just shouldn't be a third yeah. prequel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that 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 was the road I thought they were setting up with the end of that. Right. I was like, hmm. So I guess if it is a recent creation, they're going to go back in time, drop it off a few eons ago, and that reconciles that. But 
my my biggest fear of the third prequel is is going to be it's David inside an engineer suit and he's the one that gets chest bursted somehow, introducing the biomechanical elements into the alien, and the crew of the Covenant are going to be the egg morphed um, cargo in the in the derelict's hold, and I think I'd put my fist through a monitor. If, and you're going to uh, have a DH CG Sigourney Weaver as part of yes. the crew for some reason. Well, no, it, it's going to end with a DH Sigourney <laughs> stepping onto the, the Nostromo oh, to head off. Oh, the Star I, Wars I, Rogue One style. Yeah. That I, have, is my... I, have a, I have a theory about what's actually going to happen, and I cannot share it publicly. So talk to me privately afterwards. And now everyone who's listening or watching this is going to be saying on your comment board, what was it? What did he say? <laughs> so uh, I really can't say this one because I think it might actually be right. And mm. I'm not going to publicly put that out there and then lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We, we do like our franchise secrets. So. Yes. No, we don't um, know any secrets. Don't be, yeah, don't no. be spreading yeah. rumors. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you guys get all your secrets also? <laughs> what secrets, Drew? We've what just you, been yeah. through. No, I was just joking. <laughs> uh, uh, anybody who sees some of my desktop pictures might see clues as to some of our secrets. <laughs> and it, no, I didn't say that. There's nothing on my desktop. Don't go Let, looking. Let's get a screenshot going. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's nothing there. But you know what? I I had some points to come off of everything that was being said, and I now can't remember them. Um, I did. I did want to say though that I fucking love your barroom stories mentality. Yeah, I think that's, that that's is a cool way of looking. Fucking about it. brilliant way to just get it all together and make it all work and and be good for everybody. And you know, when when I saw you first mention that, I was like, that is genius. I love it. So everybody can be happy because especially now, you know, everybody is concerned about their canon you know their head canon and, and it just worked as you know it, it just worked in terms of making that all come together see i also, worked on oh you first go ahead so i was just gonna kind of tie it into that i really liked your element of the morse's space beast to kind of um explain to an extent like the players know about the alien but they have to kind of act like they don't but the element of space beast is like Okay, that that makes that make sense. Where they may have heard something about this. That's literally why I had that cult spreading across the frontier because I was like, "There's no way around this. You're gonna be hard pressed to find a player who's gonna play Alien who doesn't know about the Alien. We literally have to tell them about it somehow. Mm -hmm. Oh, this exists in the universe already. Why don't I just make this being widespread? It's a banned book that's getting spread anyway. You don't see you see that stuff happen anyway. So it just it was a logical way. So I'm really glad you you brought that up. That's totally what my thought behind it was. So yeah, we we we've used it a few times to get around that knowledge because Adam in particular is a fucker for not being able to separate himself. <laughs> when yeah. when we when we. I think it was either the first time or the second time we were playing chariots. I'm just this like, idiot, let's stay on the ship and send the Android. There with his helmet on <laughs> and not go anywhere. <sighs> Have the Android do everything for us and we'll just get out of here. Yeah. But... See, that's funny because it's like <clears throat> my, my approach. I was OK. When we were playing uh, the UK Game Expo thing, um, the. Uh, I was still the first character to die. Okay, but but I died literally like seven minutes before everybody else did. So my my philosophy is different. I know what's going to happen, and I'm not saying like it was the second time you played, so you knew exactly what was going to happen. You knew you know what was going to happen on that ship and chariot. Uh, I'm not talking about that, but you got an idea. Okay, this is probably what's going to happen, just because I know the way these films go. I know the way this universe goes. <laughs> I'm going to run right towards it because the game master is not expecting that, <laughs> you know? So it's like, I try, I try to do the opposite and I stay alive pretty much by that. You sat on the ship. Possible spoiler, the ship could have exploded and you could have just sat there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, fortunately there were other players going, stop being a dick. Let's get on the <laughs> Yeah. And then I kind of, 
got into that headspace more. So I, I feel like I've been doing better about that. Uh, I, I suppose that's, that's a difficult thing about it, though, because for a lot of us who are playing in our group, I say a lot of us, it's probably about half of us, this is our gateway drug. You know, we've come into this because it's alien. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily we, we came into it because we love RPGs as a format. Right. So that 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 was, uh, you know, a really big part of the challenge is, is getting into the format. Um, but I imagine that's been the case for a lot of people. Um, well, with... see, that's oh. that's one of the things, too, that I really uh, commend Thomas and Freelink for doing. Um, because that's a lot of times I've added, I told you I tried to add in, okay, I think this is how the rule would be to make this make sense. And he's like, I'll, I'll fix it. And it comes back, and I'm like, that's it? One die roll? That, that's going to be that? And then I'm seeing the way these players are playing it, who've never played the game. And I was like, he's absolutely right. This is a gateway drug. He has made these rules very easy to get into, uh, as opposed to other games, like the, the leading edge game. Which uh, was table after it, table after it, table of stuff. I mean, my, my ears started bleeding just <laughs> just trying to read it, you know? Not my <laughs> eyes, my ears, because I was trying to hear it. Um, so, but but this is, this is, this is great way to introduce because, you know, hey, we've got this huge franchise fan base. Maybe they haven't gamed yet. Let's bring them in. And the game is entertaining and pretty enough that gamers are also like, oh, this is a different way of playing. I can get in with that. So we're getting both audiences, which is great. Yeah. I think the presentation of the rule book is a big part of that, too. Like, I looked through the old rule book of the original alien rpg the 90s one that i i never played but totally different world in terms of presentation like the free league is just a whole nother level with the artwork and the lore and how it's all laid out like it's very engaging i think well like dungeons and dragons especially always had beautiful paintings and stuff but the um the way books were put out back then it's very different than it is now. I mean, it was so much cheaper to print on black and white. Um, so it was difficult to get photos to not look blurry. I don't mean blurry, but like muddy. Uh, could, the contrast would never be enough in them uh, with the way the printing process was. So that old book is indicative of a lot of the stuff that came out back then. Yeah. You look at the things now and, and the level is completely different. And I got to tell you, though, uh, in agreement with what you said um i have i have worked on a lot of books and i have invariably been disappointed in most of the books that i have worked on that i wasn't also the art director on i've been like oh okay it's gonna look better mm. um this is the first time i, I was worried because i love alien so much and i wrote the stuff and i was like i don't i don't know I don't know if they're going to use everything I wrote. I didn't know anything. I didn't know how this was going to go. And then I got the first samples of the way the book looks back. And I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. This is this is great. I, I, I couldn't have designed this better myself. I bowed to the superior intellect. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they definitely know how to make this look great. And that's why I tell everybody it's not, yes, I'm the writer. The game got the award because we all did a great job on it. Yeah. yeah, and sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you earlier. I think you had a, a point you were bringing up in terms of uh, the barroom stories philosophy that that Aaron was saying. Oh, I don't remember. This may not be it, but this is something I did want to say about it. Um, when I was reading those Star Wars novels that came out in the '90s, there would be a one-line mention of something that happened in the old Marvel comic from the 80, from the early '80s. And it would just be a throwaway mention. And it would be something like, it would always be something like it was a rumor or something like that. And I would go crazy reading that one little line because I love those Marvel comics so much. And now it's canon, you know, as a fan, looking at this in my head. And and just that that's where, that's what gave me the idea for the barroom thing. It's just, but I decided, I, that was always like, you know, you'd read four novels and there'd be one little mention that one author put in. I'm like, no, every page is going to be full of this. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you've already sort of mentioned that you 
not only wrote the core book and the lore, but you have become uh, something of, of the adventure writer, so to speak. Um, and you've done two scenarios for the game so far, Chariot of the Gods and Destroyer of Worlds. Now, when when it comes to that switch between the, the, the lore and the story writing and, and the scenario writing, there's just so much you have to account for in terms of player actions, but also keeping your overall narrative of the story that you're trying to tell with the scenario. So, so from a narrative perspective and, you know, you also being somebody who's written novels and comics, was that switch over from, from here's all this background. I've also done, I don't want to say straightforward, but you know, um, proper <clears throat> narrative kind of, um, adventure prose. structures. Yeah. yeah. Pr prose. Did you find it difficult to switch into that? scenario writing or was it you know you've had all this G uh, dm experience in the background i know how to deal with these idiot players let's well not idiot um, players these unpredictable yeah, no, players. I hear what you're I hear what um so chariot i wasn't supposed to write um that adventure it wasn't called chariot at the time but the idea was that you know the idea of uh they find a ship from you know a hundred years ago or whatever that that basic premise there was always there before i even got involved in it. okay um i don't know who was writing the adventure i don't know what happened i don't know because uh, i've heard different stories i don't know if they got something that they didn't like or if the writer had to bow out i don't know the details at all but thomas i think went to joe and said um, we need we need another adventure writer, and I think Joe may have recommended just see if Drew wants to do it. Again, this is all hearsay of what happened beforehand. But then Thomas came to me and said, "Hey, do you want to do this too?" And that changed everything for me because I expected I was just going to be the encyclopedia guy on this, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I had written so many adventures. And I don't know how many times a game session would end with my players sitting around the table telling me how much they hated me, um, <laughs> in a good way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not, not 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 you know, I hate you because you just put us through this hell that we somehow survived. Way, like, um, and I was like, yeah, totally, I want to do it. And I'm like, I've never done professionally, but let's see what happens. Um, and so that became for chariot for me became making sure there was something interesting in every room. Of the ship okay um that was i would say chariots a dungeon crawl you know uh, do, do you guys are familiar with that term or no yeah mm -hmm. oh, okay. I, I, i'm not but... okay. uh classic dungeons and dragons adventures is okay there's this there's this map there's this it's a dungeon and there's treasure in there somewhere or there may be treasure spread throughout just go through this place and explore it kill whatever you come across and yada yada Okay, so that's what I designed it as. And then after I had it as the dungeon crawl, I was like, now the novelist in me needs to make this a really cool story. Uh, they already had the idea that they wanted to do the cinematic scenarios. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to approach it in a way that with, with, with things we hadn't seen before. Um, I don't, I'm trying to I'm trying to say this without giving spoilers for Chariot, because I know uh, Chariot just came with the starter kit, so I don't want to I don't want to spoil it. So maybe we won't go to this direction with it. But um, Destroyer of Worlds was a completely different out. Um, writing that wound up being really tough for many reasons. Um, one is my first thought was I'm going to put the kitchen sink in this. <laughs> so I'm trying to put, I'm going to put everything in this, and then in this act, something completely different happens, and and Thomas is like, reel it in, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was an interesting experience, and we were a little worried about it when it was done, because it is, it is the next level, compared to Chariot. Okay, I, I love, I, I in the end, I love both of them. I think they both came out great, especially after 
stepping away for a few months and then seeing the finished product in my hand. I was like, oh, okay, this actually came out really, really great. Um, <clears throat> but it's, and I've seen people talk about this, it, the, the, the chariot is alien, but Destroyer is aliens. The action, there's so much happening. Um, uh, the, it, it's, it's one person's survival versus the destruction of a colony. You know, it, it's, 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 very, it's a very different type of story, and that fits really well with what it's supposed to be. Um, so, yeah, the novelist in me fights with it sometimes. Um, there's, you, you'll notice that in Chariot, um, and there, I think it's once in Chariot, and maybe three times in Destroyer, there's some description of something happening that's horrendous. Um, and it's like, I know the one in Chariot, I've read several times that players have, the, the GMs have said that my players are just sitting there with their jaw on the table after mm -hmm. reading, after I read this out loud to them. So, um, so it had the effect I wanted it to. But again, it's like novels to me, it's like I was putting these in all over the place in Destroyer. And Thomas very rightfully said, pull some of those out. Because the few that you, if you have these, just these few, they have so much more impact. So it, it's, 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 it's a struggle that I'm figuring out as I go along. Um, but I love it. I actually, I think I might actually enjoy it more than writing novels. Um, especially when I hear the responses of how people played. Um, uh, somebody was telling me how, you know, uh, th their campaign ended with basically the, a, a knife fight in space that, and it was, it was the adventure that I had written. I'm not going to give detail. I'm so trying not to be spoilery here. Um, but I was like, I never would have thought of that, but it fits completely with everything that I accidentally set up beforehand. And it's nice to see that happen, or it's nice to see them actually open the door I wanted them to open, even though I never told the GM open that door. I put that door there, you know? So it, it, it's really, it's, it's amazing to see how people's personal lives are affected by this, because it's much more personal when you're doing a game like this. It, it's, it's much more personal than, than like something like Alien Isolation also. Alien Isolation, you're playing it and you're involved and you're in there and you're jumping out of your seat when the alien is, comes in the room. But at the same time, it's a preset thing that has to happen on this level. You know, in this game, you can go, you know, we have to, we have to go to the police station. All right, well, I'm going to go to the spaceport. Okay. There's something to cover that <laughs> if you want to go to the spaceport, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's really you, you making your choices. And it's interesting to see how, what I can put in there that guides people into going in the direction of the story through their choices instead of forcing their choices. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I think that one covers it with, with uh, <laughs> varying degrees of other stuff. Uh, no, that's 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 cool because I, I've I I haven't GM this yet, but I really want to because reading through the core book, there was just so many different elements that set ideas firing off in my head, and I've, I've been taking I've been putting a load of notes down, but then I I also sort of. When I'm playing it, I struggle when people don't want to follow the story. Mm. So as as I'm trying to conceive this scenario, I'm like, ah, but am I going to be a dick if I don't? If I just go, no, it's fucking locked. Piss off. <laughs> so yeah, it's it, it's well, it's an interesting thing because it's not quite a follow your own story kind of um do you remember those books where you used to choose your own adventure and go to page 32 yeah. yeah it's not quite that but it's also you know it's not a, a linear narrative so as as the storyteller on the fly you know how how insane do you let the participants go to... I, I, I i tell i tell gm things like Okay, you don't want them to go in that room. Then, yeah, like you said, the door is locked. They're insisting on going in that room. Okay, so they're going to cut the door open with the, the the torches thing. Put something behind that door that makes them regret that they decided to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's like you. It's still their choice, but then it's their choice to close that door and board it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it, it's. 
it's just you, you just gotta you gotta and, and that's literally why I put weird things in there sometimes. If your players decide to go off the rails and do this, there's this here for you. Um, I never expected every room to be explored in Chariot. And yet I'm hearing about how players are insisting on going into every single room. And I'm like, well, I'm glad I decided to detail every room. You know? <laughs> Um, and then I've also heard GM saying that they've played it with the same group and they, it's like they've gone to a completely different set of rooms instead, you know? So it's, it, it, it works that way. Uh, you, you just have to... And it, it, it's even better when you know your, your players. Like, if, if, you know, if you're like, all right, this dumbass is totally going to do this. I've known him for 20 years. <laughs> I'm totally going to write something to cover what he's going to do and he's going to regret it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I always say regret it, but they really don't regret it because you're not trying to kill your players. You don't want to kill your players. You want to give them a good time. And you want to give them a hard time. But you want to give them a good hard time. Oh, no, that doesn't sound right at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our usual uh, GM, Chris, he put it nicely. He's like, we're always rooting for the players to survive, even if we're throwing stuff at you. Yeah. I guess yeah. they want they want to see how it ends as much as you know, everybody else. Yeah, I, there's there's some GMs uh, I've encountered throughout the decades that are just, you know, obviously not on Alien, just meeting in any game, that they're just hell-bent on killing the players. And I'm <laughs> like, what does that get you? Because then now you, you got half a night of a session instead of uh, four sessions out of this, and now they have to make new characters. Do you just like the making new characters part? <laughs> it's, like, I, I, it's like, you know, you, you I... I I would give my players in Dungeons and Dragons, I would give them, as they grew in skills, I'd give them worse and worse stuff to deal with. And sometimes it'd be stuff that's way out of their level. But there would always be a couple of ways that they could beat it. And those ways would be based on what I knew about the players at the time. And they would never grant them all, but they'd always figure out at least one of them somewhere along the line and defeat the problem. So that's that's just my philosophy. Um, the GM needs to take control of the table, but he also has to be flexible enough to change to what the players, what crazy things the players think they should be doing instead. So one of the things that I got another start again. One of the things that I just absolutely loved about the core book was all the little bits of Deep Lord dotted around. And it was those particularly obscure things like uh, Kenner's hover tread tank and the hosts for Kenner's uh, little scorpion alien figures too. Now, <laughs> of, of all the little bits of the Deep Lord that you included in the book, what was your favourite? My favourite? Yeah. The, the bit that you just absolutely were like so chuffed with yourself that you got it there. That's a good question. See, I, it's funny because when you say the scorpion alien thing, I don't think it was my favorite, but it was something I was very proud of. Um, because when I first saw the scorpion alien figures in the 90s come out, I was like, they come out of a scorpion? How's it come out of a score? This is so dumb. That's literally what I thought, okay? And I didn't buy those figures back then. I bought them many years later when I realized how cool they really are and their weird, weird, uh, totally 90s way. sensibilities. I mean, Bishop looks like he belongs in a, a Rob Liefeld comic book. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, but the... Um, <clears throat> I liked... I, I just... I, I, I really can't think of a favorite. I, I just really enjoy making these things that were nonsensical make sense and and making those the 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 scorpionoids was a deep dive into uh deep sea scorpions from the prehistoric age and all this other stuff and you know so i just i just really have fun doing that i can't, honestly can't think of any particular one that i loved the most because i think it just became uh oh and now i'm going to add this one and now i'm going to add this one so Kitchen sink aspect. Yes. Yes. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so this is this is just one of those things that I was I was again on the same theme of, of the deep law kind of thing. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about was one particular tiny aspect of the Neomorph as you wrote him in the in the law book. 
And that was having them die after 24 hours. So I was curious as to if that was a callback to the original intent, the very first alien, them dying after a day. Yes, and um, <clears throat> so a lot of people have problems with, and personally I do too as a fan, the variable gestation time on an alien. Um, I always felt it should be at least 12 hours because that's the impression I got about Kane in the first movie, okay? Um, but obviously that's been sped up in different things and everything like that. And nothing's been, well, maybe AVP. Uh, as fast as the Neomorph. But what's crazy about the Neomorph is that, you know, it plops out on the floor in Covenant and we're watching it visibly grow. By the time it's like in the netting, this is spoiler trailing Covenant, by the way. Um, <laughs> if anyone who hasn't seen it who's watching this podcast, I don't know why you haven't seen it, go watch it already. Um, you can see it's bigger when she's shooting at it. You know, it, it's gotten bigger. And I thought a lot, if the metabolism of this thing is that it's growing so fast, it's got to burn itself out. And then I, I remembered something about the, the alien having a short lifespan, and I found it, and I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to play this alien, but the Neomorph makes perfect sense that it burns out. So. And I actually have an answer to your other question. I just realized what my favorite part was. So remind me after, after we're done with this. Oh, oh, do it now? Yeah, yeah, go go now oh, okay. if you if you don't if you're done with the the neomorph thing. Yeah, so no, I, I just realized I remembered exactly what my favorite thing was. It's the um, the alternate version of Feifeld from Prometheus. Uh, the the uh, uh, the abomination, um, the revenant the Weta... stage. The one that Weta did. Yes, yes, in in in, in chariot. The abomination is, uh, you know, uh, one of the stages is as it appears in the movie, as as Fightful appears in the movie. Another stage is how uh, it was going to be originally, because um, I love that thing. Yeah, and I I hate that they cut it out. I think it was so much cooler, um, and I just really wanted to bring it into official lore. That that was another one of those things that I was really glad to see because it was something I missed from the film as well. Um, you know, that, that consistency of, of him appearing as an alien rather than whatever the fuck they did with the uh, practical makeup. So yeah, that so, so many times throughout the book, as I'm reading it, I was like, you know, a bit of a grin on my face because it's, it's playing into those fan things that I wish was official. And now it kind of is because of this. So, right. Yeah. I mean, the, the way I saw it is that the version we got in the final film, if that Fifeld had hung around for another six hours, he probably would have turned into what we saw in the Weta version. Um, I think anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, you can find the deleted scene on YouTube, I believe. Um, uh, put in Prometheus Fifeld monster or something like that, and, and it comes up. Um, <laughs> But uh, that I definitely thought it was much cooler the way it was supposed to be originally. I understand why uh, several of the reasons why Ridley changed it, um, and uh, the guy who played Fifield, whose name eludes me now, after seeing him and other things, I can understand why Ridley would want him to play the part as a human being instead, because he is a really good actor. So I could see. Well, he made and first appearance is like, oh, it's just a zombie. I watched the performance now, knowing how he was in, say, a Mission Impossible movie or, or or other things, and I say, oh, I see what he did there because I'm a nerd and I nitpick these things, and I don't know how many times I've seen these movies at this point. I literally have them playing in the background as I'm writing uh, the alien stuff, and most of my day is writing the alien stuff. So, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I understand all that stuff, but. It, it was, and, and, and the, the, I think the biggest worry was that people wouldn't identify it as Fifeld, as the creature it was. And that's why they gave Fifeld the tattoo in the first place, so that the creature could have the tattoo. But again, if, the, if that showed up at the door, and I didn't remember that the character's name was Fifeld, and the guy who looks at him says, Fifeld? If that hadn't happened, I'd be like, where'd the alien come from? You know, so it, it, it was probably just to make it clear to the audience, unless you guys know something I don't about it. 
Um, I'm pretty sure the wetter version still had the tattoo anyway. Yeah, yeah, but it's still, but it's hard to, I mean, think about that. If they didn't say Fifeld, would you have immediately thought it was Fifeld? No, no, but I mean, they, they, they accounted for it within, within the narrative and the visual language of the film, so. I've noticed that, I, I don't know if this is studios doing, I don't know what it is, but I've noticed this happens a lot in films. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys are fans of Red Letter Media at all. I watch them, yeah, they do some good yeah. reviews. They did, yeah. So they're they're really spot on in some things, and they are so ridiculously off on others. Um, and half the time that they're off, I feel like, guys, did you get up to go to the bathroom when that was explained? Because because <laughs> because it's right there. Um, but I love I love watching them. They're great. They're hilarious. Um, I love their ones on Prometheus and Covenant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were so good. But they, I watched the the Plinket review from them on Star Trek Nemesis the other day. Uh, I'd seen it years ago, and I was like, it, my YouTube thing, it, I watched a whole bunch of alien stuff, um, uh, uh, Alien Theory and Croft and all these other guys, and then it just started spilling into things I'd watched ages ago, and I just left it on. And they were talking about, and I know this is Star Trek, so it's off, off, off the rails a little bit, but it ties in. They are talking about how um, in the movie, a spoiler for Star Trek Nemesis, Picard clone is the bad guy but it's a younger version of his clone and his younger version of clone is bald just like picard is so when picard is looking at a picture of himself in the academy he's bald we've seen in the past scenes of picard from younger he had his hair he lost his hair slowly they in fact the younger picard is the more hair they've given him in flashbacks in the past okay yeah in the kill the, episode wasn't it yep yeah, yep yeah. Um, and then there was an episode of the Stargazer where they had him with thinning hair. Yes, yes. So, so they, they've thought about this in the show. But either the studio or the director was like, well, how are they going to know it's not Picard? He's not bald. So, so, <laughs> so, so it's like, is this overthinking sometimes about will the audience understand what this is? And, I, and, and maybe that's what happened here. I don't know. Um, like I said, I, I do like both versions. Um, and that's why I made one the stage two and the other one the stage three. But I love that creature from Rowetta thing. And I wish it had been in the movie. Yeah. Likewise, I, I do feel like um, a good number of the deleted scenes from both Prometheus and Covenant would have would have helped the films. <clears throat> a very common concern when it comes to crafting alien narrative or experience is in making sure that the alien itself isn't overplayed. And again, you kind of mentioned this before. This is something the RPG also takes in consideration with the inclusion of other extraterrestrial creatures. Was it difficult trying to include elements that would still feel alien without the actual creature itself? And that's where Prometheus comes in. Because I, I don't know if I would have been able to do it if Prometheus didn't exist. Um, it's just because uh, as all those alien comics from the 90s I loved them at first, and then I stopped reading them because I felt like, okay, same thing again, same thing again, same thing again. And then when I went back to look at them later, um, uh, when I started working on it with Fox, uh, I realized there was nuggets in there that I hadn't, that I had missed because I had. Just got, so felt like it was the same note. But Prometheus showed me that, honestly, that to be alien, it doesn't have to have the alien in it. Um, and, and so my thing is, is that I just want to make sure that any creature that we create that doesn't come from the black goo will get its ass kicked from any creature that comes from the black goo. <laughs> <laughs> Re respect so, the one, two, one, respect yes. the accelerant. Yes. And obviously, and, and above them all, it's like, I mean, Am I remembering this wrong? I know there's the scene where the alien faces a neomorph in Covenant that got cut, but didn't the, didn't the alien rip the neomorph yeah. in half or something? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Just trash yeah. the neomorph. And, and 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 I totally feel that that even that they're both from the black goo, but come on, let's face it, it's the alien. Alien always has to be top of the food chain. But I mean, it makes sense to even more than just creatures. I mean, even in terms of like the political intrigue and stuff, is is I think. I think you do. You did. You did a good job of of introducing those elements where it's like, eh, maybe the companies are fucking each other over. And... Yeah. The well, even beyond that, like the corporate exploitation of of blue collar workers and stuff like that, and there, it goes into the characters' personal scenarios as well. It ties into 
to all that, their livelihoods. So very, very much on point for the other themes of the franchise besides just the creatures. Was that a conscious effort as well? Yeah, well, what's going on with what's going on with the politics in our country right now without going into too deep um, about it, there's, to me, as, I mean, I, I lean left. Everybody knows this. Go to my Facebook page, there's no question. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be that on the right, there is confusion about what the left wants with this idea of this socialism, communist thing. <laughs> okay. And the UPP bringing something that if, 10 years ago, if I was going to put the Soviet Union in space, 10 years ago, people were like, why are you doing that? That's silly. It's outdated. Okay, but now it actually speaks to the fears of a lot of Americans very much. Um, <clears throat> so I've got the UPP in there. I've never once described them as communist. I've described them as socialist. And I'm trying to make them as human as possible. They're not just the bad guys. They're the other government. We may not agree with them, but they're never going to be the mustache twirling villains. You know, um, <clears throat> but their socialism is alien to American thinking. So that's again how I approach it. You know, can we make? Can I make it alien? The alien, any alien is some, anything we don't understand is alien, even if it's just you know. I don't understand why people like pumpkin spice coffee. That's alien <laughs> to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that that that's just my approach to to it all and. And the, the political thing, I got I to gotta also say, um, I clearly changed drastically stuff from the leading edge game. But you can see that the roots of a lot of the stuff of what I did comes from the leading edge. The whole idea of the space consortium and the, uh, I created the, uh, the, the uh, inner, inner core system colonies. Um, and they, they, they independence. Yeah, I, 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 yeah uh, independent, yes, yes. I, yes, I and C, yes, 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 yes. So anyway, I, I created them based on what they had the ICC being, I think, in Leading Edge's game. Because that clearly is not what the ICC was supposed to be. ICC is a regulation board. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but, and that gave me the idea. I was just explaining this to some players the other day uh, in a group. People were asking questions about uh, uh <clears throat> what the other companies would be doing in regards to the alien and stuff like that. And I said, you got to think of the, the people who run the, the, uh, the independent core systems. They're a conglomerate of all these top companies. So think of them as the corporate space mafia. And these are the different families. Okay. So Waylon Yutani is doing all this crazy shit, but they're also part of the families. And the other corporations are like, so uh, are you going to let us in on this? And they're like, no. So now, think of that. We could have a turf war in regards to corporations fighting with each other. Because even though they're all part of the mafia, they're different families. And they ain't seeing things the same way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminds me of this, uh, not to go on too much of a tangent, but this dystopian video game series called Syndicate where it's, um, I don't know if you've heard of that one, but it's all just warring corporate factions. No, I don't know. Um, but it, it's pretty good. But to, to go back to the, the politics of the game, yeah, I mean, it's just very interesting intrigue in that regard. Um, you know, you, you made the UPP such a, a prominent force, but yeah, they're never described as bad guys, even I think in Gibson's mm -hmm. adaptations, like mm -hmm. in the audio drama, the comic adaptation, and even the original screenplay, they're never depicted as nefarious. They're just this other force. But beyond them, um, some of the other stuff, like the uh, Britain and Japan kind of merging, the Americas kind of merging, um, there's just some really interesting space politics in there, I guess, which kind of just widens the universe even more. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole Japan and... England and Britain stuff, and then the America's Merchant, that stuff has just been part of the franchise. You know, it's like yeah. as far back as Ron Cobb's little yeah, drawings. Keynes, uh, yeah. Keynes yeah. Pat, I just uh, mean how it's all like presented together. Like this quadrant of space is owned by this government, and, right. and this is this space. It's It just makes the universe like, wow, I never realized the alien universe was quite this expansive. Uh, and, and that's what it, it that's what, what I've done here is, is I find all these little pieces, and I think 
okay, well, if that was the case, what would really come out of that? What would probably be with this? How do I relate this to something that's happening now? How do I relate this to something that actually happened with the USSR in regards to the UPP? They are in that most of the planets in their space are dead and they have a huge population. So they're having problems keeping afloat. So they're going to have to expand. You know, it's, it's a lot of, and you'll see this in the upcoming book too, the Colonial Marine book that uh, hasn't been officially announced yet. Um, but we've been talking about it, so people know it's coming at some point. Um, I have, I've looked at history, and I've looked at what has happened with major powers over and over and over again. And I have applied that to what makes sense to happening in the future in outer space, because, let's face it, we're creatures of habit. As much as I love Star Trek, we are not going to have the United Federation planets. Uh, we, we, we are going to, you know, do the same thing we've always done, unfortunately, and is, uh, you know, rape the resources, uh, the natural resources of a planet. We're going to, you know, take what we can from the weak. This is just human nature. And there's, uh, obviously, we don't have to do these things because we are sentient beings and can look past that. But unfortunately, this is what our history is. So that's what I've tried to do with the political stuff in there. So I'm, I'm thank you for mentioning it because it's something that, something I, I'm like, Am I doing all this for a reason? Everybody wants to play the, with the alien, you know? So it, it, it's cool to see that people do care about the politics behind it too. Yeah, definitely. What have you found to be the most challenging aspects of working on the game overall? I don't even know if I saw this question before. <laughs> um, it was on there. It was definitely on there. Give me a second. I'm prepared. Um, what is the most challenging? I guess the most challenging thing uh, comes back to what I was saying before when I was working on Destroyer. Um, it's uh, and I, and I'm I'm definitely more in tune with it now. Is understanding um, is boiling down and not putting everything in one book um, rain rain in yourself in yeah yeah there's all this stuff that i have to say about this universe and i'm consistently writing like I, the core book is like 100 pages longer than it was supposed to be um i didn't expect them to put everything in that i gave them but they were like all right this is good all right we can use this and they kept putting it in um and there's stuff they cut which i have put into other books instead and that's what i keep telling them. i was like i want to give everybody all these different creatures like there's these creatures in Prometheus and this and and this thing from a comic from Lee. Oh wait a minute, why don't I just wait for the next supplement? I gotta I gotta rein myself in constantly on this, because um, <clears throat> I just that's the problem with thinking. Where would the players go? Because I also think, if where would a GM want to go? Would a GM want to explore this little nugget over here? And then next thing I've known, and this has actually just happened, I was writing a campaign book, and next thing i know i had devoted seven thousand words to a planet blurb which was supposed to be about 400 <laughs> words and i i was like okay maybe this should be its own adventure because <laughs> i realized <laughs> there's all this i just put all this crazy stuff in there this crazy detail and when i read it to people they're like oh wow that's really cool but it's like this has no business being in here <laughs> all the planets are like this and then this one's for pages so yeah so it's like i gotta i gotta learn Okay, this is a really good idea. Don't try to trim it down. Remove it for something else. Put this here instead. And that, that's, the, that's my biggest problem. And it's the same problem I had with working on Planet of the Apes. Um, because the only complaint that I have gotten, um, I, generally, generally speaking, the, the, the Death of Planet of the Apes, my second Planet of the Apes novel, has gotten great reviews. But the only complaint that I've seen consistently is the kitchen sink uh, that I put so much in there. And uh, again, that novel, I was hired to do 85,000 words, and I wrote 125, and I used 122 of them. So um, I, I need to reel myself in. And on the reverse of the last question, what would you say has been the most rewarding part of your involvement with the RPG? Oh, that's easy. Um, the paycheck. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> No, the most rewarding part, honestly, is the fan reactions. Um, 
because I played this completely right, I think, in, in leaving it accessible to, to people's headcanon, and they appreciate it. Um, yeah, definitely. People will notice things that I forgot I put in there. <laughs> it's like <laughs> there was somebody on a board today who was talking about this planet, and that they found this planet in this video game that had nothing to do with aliens, and clearly this was the planet that I had put in the thing. And I was like, I don't know about that video game. Where did I get that from? It turns out it's also in the Leading Edge game. The person who wrote that video game made an alien planet in homage to the name of something from the Leading Edge game in the 90s and blah, 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 blah. So that was a rabbit hole I had nothing to do with. But it's just like, oh, is that what I did? I don't know if that's <laughs> what I did. <laughs> so so it's, 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 it's great that everybody loves it. And, and I love, and I've said this with this part I've said before, I love the fact that I see people laughing online about, oh my God, we had such a great time. I was beheaded and he was ripped in <laughs> two and it was so fun. And like, That's amazing. That's amazing because usually I'm used to, as a D&D &D guy, I'm used to the player kicking the table over when his character dies. <laughs> <you know? laughs> uh, that's brilliant. And like, like I said earlier, you know, so many awards as well. It's not just the fans, is it? This, this game has become acclaimed. So well, I mean, I'm 48 years old and I've got never had an award before, except for something probably in grammar school. Uh, yeah, the science award, science project award. Um, so that's my only award until now, and I've got three this year. So I'm like, this is great. We got a great team on this because mm -hmm. you know, uh, honestly, let's face it. If I wrote this thing great, and the art and the mechanics were bad, it wouldn't have gotten the awards. You know, if, if any of one of us was off, it wouldn't have worked. So it's a synergy of, of all of us. It's great. So, yeah, it's and congrats great. on the awards, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And time for the most important question out of this <laughs> entire lot of questions. Drew, when the fuck are you going to give me a VP70? Is, is it going to be in this upcoming Colonial Marines call book? But, yes, it is. As <laughs> soon as you said something, I put it in the next book possible. And that's the Colonial Marine book. You will get uh, your PP70. I don't know why you want it so badly. I don't know why I want it so badly either. I Honestly, fucking... statistics-wise, it's almost the same as the M4. The red everything. The, the other one, the, the M43. The what is pistol. it? M4, what, M43. Service pistol, isn't it? Yeah. But it's yeah got, I, 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 I don't remember the acronym for that I mean, one. It, but you know what? I even uh, they, they ask me. They're, they're like, okay, so uh, figure out what vehicles... And weapons you want in this and i i i connected them with the current art studio that's doing the weapons not the not the people who did the core book but the ones who did the weapons and the vehicles that are in destroyer uh, though the, they're they're a studio that i knew that i hooked them up with and so they're like so talk to the studio and tell them what guns you want to do and everything and the first thing i did was send them that picture that either you or someone sent mail sent me someone sent me a picture of a vp70 was that you I think we've we've talked about it. Yeah, well, whoever like it would picture, be you, I said do this one first. I'm tired of hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in there. Right. If, so just as an aside from that, I know you mentioned the Clone of Marines core book uh, expansion um, earlier. Is, is there much sort of? Um, is it likely we're going to be seeing further 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 expansions and, and core books after this Clone of Marines thing? No, we thought the game was too popular. We're, we're just going to say, well, we're cool. <laughs> yes, there's going to be plenty more. Um, um, hold on one second. Let me just get you this. Where the hell is it? There's three themes for the game. The, 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 the Colonial Marines, the Space Truckers. Ah, uh, shit, what was the other one? It's a it's sense of wonder, so it's explorers. Yes. yes. Okay. So yeah. So chariot. Hold on a second. Can I help you? Chariot <laughs> is <laughs> chariot is um, space truckers. Clearly, clearly destroyer is colonial marines. Um, so the next campaign book will go into sense of wonder. We will explore things we have not seen before. Mm. I think that answers Caleb's question in a bit. Then, uh, in terms in terms of cinema, uh, more cinematic scenarios. So, so we've got more cinematic stuff coming up, and we've got more core books coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Chariot kicked off a trilogy. Um, 
if you've played Destroyer, you know there are elements that have to do with Chariot in there. Unless we're, we're at the end, we're at the end of Act One. We've run into some of the elements from um, Chariots. Okay, so yeah, you've you've, you've seen it already. Okay, um, hold on. Let me feed the beast before the alien hits me. <laughs> so the um, yeah, so there's a third one that finishes off that storyline. Okay. Okay. And um, then there's there's a whole bunch of other stuff we have planned. Um, that Colonial Marine adventure thing I just I mentioned before that accidentally became seven thousand words. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, we're, we're exploring that to see if we can make that work. Um, there, we want to do stuff for. Um, uh, we want to actually do a, a space trucker campaign book, even though the core book pretty much sets that up as if it is it. We want to do an expansion for that moving forward. We want to do something with androids. We want to do something corporate. So we got a whole bunch of stuff going. And, there's, and the there's idea, a lot of scope. Yeah, the idea is is that you will get a campaign book and an adventure that has something to do with whatever's in the campaign book. Okay. At the very least, you'll get that. Some some concepts you might get four adventures and a campaign book for, depending on what seems to work the most at the time. But um, but yeah, so in this case, Destroyer, we were originally going to do Destroyer and the campaign book coming out at the same time. But um, COVID changed things. So the, core, the, the campaign book got pushed back a little bit. Uh, and Destroyer, that's Destroyer they released with the starter kit instead. Yeah, so, mm, fair enough. So, so you're still getting the amount of products we were planning on doing, uh, and just what, what other things have got pushed back a little bit, but everything's coming. Okay, it's doing too, well, it's, it, honestly, it's doing too well not to come. So <laughs> yeah, this has been one of the most promising things in the franchise I've, I've seen for a while, honestly, and I think this could become quite a big thing for fans uh, years into the future. Honestly, I'd love to see something like Hope's Last Day, but for alien isolation, like the downfall of Sebastopol. Like if you did something where survivors were trying to escape, that would be pretty cool, I think. That is a very cool idea, yeah. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, <laughs> but before we sign off, we do have a, a Well, it's question. just one now. It's yeah. just one now, yeah, from okay. one of the members of our community. As well as writing lore, you were also one of Fox's canon men, so this seems like the perfect question for you. The Kruntus? Did I pronounce that? I have no idea how to pronounce that. <laughs> one of the, the main the people behind the Cruentus, there we go. Uh, one of the main people behind Xenopedia would like to know what elements of the RPG are considered canon as opposed to mechanics for the game. And just to clarify, I think by as opposed to mechanics for the game, he's talking in terms of like some of the cast system for the aliens. I see. <clears throat> um Interesting. Okay, so here's the thing about canon, and this is speaking as the canon consultant and, you know, the guy who works on Bibles and all that stuff. Canon is canon until it's not. Uh -huh. So as of right now, everything about the aliens right there is a hypothesis that the scientists have determined and broken things down into steps that is canon until those scientists in the game who are only human are proven wrong. That's until Rid because, Ridley says otherwise. That's what it comes down to. Because it, it literally comes down to Ridley or if, if Brandywine is doing it, it comes down to Brandywine. They will always be able to do whatever they want without saying, oh, no, but the role-playing game said this. Yeah. They're not going to worry about that. Okay? The film always takes precedence. Yes, 100%. And as soon as the, a film comes out, as far as I'm concerned, anything that was contradicted in this, we write explanation around it now. Because, yes, that's a film. That should always come first. I am not creating this universe. I don't own this universe. I am extrapolating things to make, make this universe breathe a little more. Um, <clears throat> but every, if, it's a, if it's in this book, it's been approved as canon. So, like, I, actually, I was saying to somebody, let me just find it here. I was saying to somebody on Facebook earlier today, um, yeah, okay. So I was, I was saying, someone said, um, someone asked me about this. They asked me about, um, uh, is this planet canon? I said, yes, the planet is canon. But like you said, the barroom thing. Uh -huh. So, for example, if someone says to me, uh, think of it this way. Someone mentions that planet in a bar. 
and this just you know goes back to everything before. And the guy said, the guy next to him says, "Oh, I heard of that place. Isn't that the place where someone made a synthetic alien who smoked cigars and thought it was Jerry Lewis?" No, no, it's not. <laughs> the planet exists. Jerry <laughs> might not exist. Yeah. Uh, yes. I hope Jerry I, exists. I have a player who loves how much I hate Jerry. So he sent me Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> nice, how the can Eagle you Moss hate one. Jerry. <laughs> I, come, Heathen. This, this, look, there's nothing wrong with Jerry. Okay. In fact, I actually really love this figure. It's hilarious. Okay. But this is alien resurrection thinking, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. <laughs> this takes away the horror of the alien. There's no horror here. <laughs> this is hilarious. Okay. Do you see horror? <laughs> Shush up, you. Well, that's the interesting thing with Alien is you're seeing things like the Alien cookbook coming out, and you have like Aliens yeah. kids books now. Like that's great. That's great. I love that. That's a fun way to get them interested. But I guarantee you that cookbook is not canon in the universe. Now, <laughs> no. I I, don't I, think I, might, I might I might make some crazy guy who's making a cookbook in regards yeah. to aliens and mention him in the universe. The, but the, the fucking race. From, oh, is it Reapers? Oh, shit. From the AVP thing? No, not, not AVP. Um, I help if I could bastard spell. There we go. Um, is this the right one? I don't feel like it's the right one. No, it's not Reapers. Uh, there's a fucking short comic where there's some dinosaur fucking oh, eating, eating. They're eating the eggs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. that race that came up with the cookbook. There you go. Although I don't know if that race exists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know again, it's it's it it's a game, okay? And at the end of the day, the person whose universe this is is being created by the game master and the players. And with any game if you're like, oh, wow, I really love this, but you know what? I don't like the encumbrance rules. I think I want to use the encumbrance rules from this game instead. I only said encumbrance because the, the core book is actually open on my computer screen and encumbrances the page it's opened on. <laughs> so, so, so um, you know, so, okay, it's your universe. Change it. So it's whatever you want it to be. So yeah. we, we, we said that on, on our review episode that we just released today. At the end of the day, this is just a guidelines do what the fuck you will with it and enjoy yourself. And that's a lot of it's most of it's, you know, I'm fucking perfectly content with as is, but if you are not, they, they're just, they're just guidelines. They're just suggestions. Yeah. I mean, it's a, frame, and, and, it's a framework for you to tell your yeah, own stories. Your that's, that, that, that's a better word for it. Yeah. And coming back to totally, you know, what I was saying before is as far as I'm concerned, alien three, I mean, it's a film, so even if I didn't like it, I don't like I don't like Resurrection very much. But it, it counts; it's canon that happened. I like to think that maybe Alien Resurrection was told from the point of view of one of the pirates who was high at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jonah at a bar after the yeah, fight. There you go. But 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 there is a clone of Ripley, okay? And that ship had that problem. It may have not gone down the way we saw it, but that's in my head. Okay, that's in my head. Canon wise, Alien 3, we using going back to that example. Alien 3 happened. There's no question. However, I respect the fact that other people don't like that. They have their Gibson out if they want in the story. Yeah. Or you can just say, I, I, you know what someone could easily do? Someone could take that Gibson, someone could take that Gibson hook I put in there, and they can create an adventure based on the Gibson story and put your players through it instead. Yeah. So it wasn't Ripley and Hicks. It was you guys. But yeah. someone out there is like, hey, wasn't that that colonial Marine from Hadley's Hope? No, it was me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's, it works. It works. Now, I'm going to put, I'm going to ask you this now. It's not on the list, but it's just reminded me of it. And so it's on the record and I'm sick of people telling me to fuck oh, off and question me when, when, I, when, I, <laughs> when I say no. Colonial Marines. <laughs> that 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 is not no longer considered canon. Yes, right. Listen to, listen to me carefully, fans. <laughs> you voted with your dollars. Colonial Marines is not canon. 
There we go. It oh, was intended as no, no. It was intended as canon, but it had a very bad reception. It was not loved. Um, I mean, I I don't blame the company that made it. Gearbox was it Gearbox? Yes, or... Gearbox. Well, made is such a loose term when it comes yeah, to Yeah, they that. really outsourced it. Um, right. There's a lot of crazy stuff that happened that led to it being what it was, and it's unfortunate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but I, the idea that Hicks is alive, it's it's so it's a little contrived the way it's done in there. It doesn't, oh, doesn't really fit. And <laughs> the decision was made by Fox when... It was when the reboot happened, wasn't it? 2014. Stephanie. Is it Stephanie or Steve Perry? Who wrote the... Stephanie. Stephanie. Stephanie wrote... It would, if you'll notice that book, mentions Alien Isolation, but does not mention Colonial Marines. Yeah. This and is they, the Wayland yutani report for people wondering. Yes. And this came out years ago. And the decision was made back then. Oof, you know what? Colonial Marines doesn't count. So, using that as the barroom thing... Mm-hmm. And the fact that we have action figures and whatever of these creatures that keep popping up everywhere, like the Charger, um, the creatures exist, the guns exist. You know, a lot of the a lot of the people that were in those games probably exist in the Alien universe, but the story we heard about them in the game <laughs> is a barroom story. Turks out there somewhere for all you Turk fans. <laughs> he's Turkey still fit. alive. He's, he's not. He's not burnt in a furnace on on uh, fury. Yeah, where's the outrage about that? Where's <laughs> the outrage like it was about Hickstein? Why isn't everybody angry about Turk? I mean, everybody, like... everybody's <laughs> angry about Turk's ex- existence. <laughs> uh, Turk exists. He wasn't in that pod. Exactly. I mean, but Turk. you know what? In your adventure, in your universe, go for it. Turk you know it what? up. Turk it oh, up. <laughs> I think I think I'm gonna have to take on the Turk persona for um <laughs> for some of the future sessions now. Oh yeah, that that reminded me of something else. I was just about to make a joke about Wilkes. Is okay. Rim coming? Is Rim coming into this at any point? Rim's I was looking. At, was it on the map? I was looking for it and I couldn't see it. Um, on the left, along the center line. You'll see it all the way on the edge. Okay. On the, on the rim of space. <laughs> <laughs> I shall go back and find that. So I was yeah, and in, in fact, in fact, there's a joke about rim in the Colonial Marines book that's coming up. Okay. Nice. I think it's like you say, something's just canon until it's not, until the studio wants to go in a different direction. Mm-hmm. But thankfully we have head canon, so. Yep. I, 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 I really... Um, I really had high hopes for Colonial Marines. Um, oh, and everybody. Did. everybody did. We were hyping that game for so long. Man, yeah. I still think it's a fun play. Oh, yeah. Uh, I like you it. No, for me, it's a cool little sci fi museum. And I think some of the mods uh, that people have done through the years, um, as well as I, I liked the multiplayer, even when it yeah, came no, out. The multiplayer I, was always fun, but you yeah. can't fix that fucking trash of a narrative. The, th- the, the biggest problem for me, and the whole reason why I was very happy to find out he was no longer considered canon, uh, it's, not e- it's not even Hicks. Okay? I could, that's a stretch. I guess I can live with it. Okay? But the colony, yeah. no. Yeah. No. Vaporized. It's clearly said it was vaporized. <laughs> it's clearly shown being vaporized. And it's still there, and Hudson's body is there? Hudson's body isn't even it, it vaporized? Come on. Yeah. And Waylon Yutani is going back and forth from Fury 1 6 and setting up a base at, at uh, LV 426. Yeah, I don't that's... mind that. I don't mind that part, actually. I don't mind that part. I, I wouldn't have gone there with it, but I can understand them. I, look, it seems clear. If the ship survived, after all the shit that went down, they're going to try and find that ship. Yeah. Okay? yeah. And they're going to try and mine it. In fact, the Bloom Camp thing seems to. <clears throat> Like, and I don't know the details of anything, but it looks like they built a building around the ship. Well, what um, I mean, what I mean was funny is that you have uh, Bishop Two going to Fury One Six One to try and get the alien from Ripley when they have a bunch of these fucking aliens back on LV Four Twenty Six when they had the yeah. base set up. So it would have made more sense if he had gone there, and when that failed, they went to the planet. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, 
Well, if I remember well, yeah. rightly, I think AVP Classic had them as having been sterilised by the blast from the um, the the atmosphere processor. Interesting. Um, yeah, I left it as a hook for people who wanted to use it. Yeah. In fact, there is uh, in earlier printings of the book there is a slight mistake. Um, typos creep up into anything. Um, we realized that a station that I put uh, over yeah, it, the the one yeah. from AVP. Yeah, it, it, yeah. And I, I when I realized, oh wait a minute, that's an AVP source that can't be there. I I, I was wondering. I yeah. switched its name, but in one one location, it still has the old name, unfortunately. Um, but then, you know what? Maybe somebody thinks that's what the station's called. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? You know, it's it's the, it's it's a universe for you to live and breathe in. You take what you like, you reject what you don't. Mm -hmm. um, I I see so many players all the time. Well, I'm putting predators in. For me, that's blasphemy. This is this is my pure alien universe. For you. And I will tell you, put the Smurfs in. If it works for you, <laughs> do it. It's your game. Have fun. This is about fun. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that's what it ultimately boils down to at the end of the day. So. Right. Well, that is actually everything from us. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say? Any anecdote? Any thought that we just haven't given you the opportunity to discuss so far? Not that I can think of. I think I've talked too much already. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing as too much when it comes to uh, nerding out. Yeah. yeah, I like nerding out with you guys. Yeah, if people knew all the stuff that we talked about that didn't get recorded, it would be uh, there'd be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, I can't even talk about that. All right, no, I can't talk about the pro <laughs> There's projects that I'm working on that I can't talk about yet because they need to make official announcements first. But um, uh, but I will drop this little hint. There's something, there's a brand you mentioned earlier in this conversation that I'm actually working on, and don't ask me what it was. But so people who listen to it later can think about it. Um, but in addition to that, we have a whole bunch of new Alien stuff coming out. Uh, I, I'm, on, I'm on Alien as long as, as long as they'll have me because I have... I think I've pitched six additional books to them. Nice. Um, and, you know, it, uh, we're, everybody's happy with what's happening. So we're going to be working on this for a while. Um, and as long as you like it, we'll be doing it. Sounds good to me. Sounds perfectly good to me. Right. Well, Drew, thank you so much for coming and wasting a couple of hours of your time with us. Yeah. That's I say wait, wait, maybe wasting on your perspective. but um, It's perfectly. not a waste. <laughs> I'm playing. Um, is there any outlets, uh, website, social presence that you'd like to shout out for folk to come and stalk you on? Yeah, um, I'd like people to go to um, my Facebook page, uh, which is just Andrew E. Yaska. Uh, talk to me there, connect with me. Um, my author page is getting some renovations, but we're going to try and drive people to that as well soon. But um, in addition to my Facebook page, uh, my blog, it's roguereviewer.wordpress.com. That's rogue, as in rogue one, reviewer, not rouge, reviewer, like people <laughs> say rouge one all the time when they're typing. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's my blog, and I talk about uh, alien stuff and uh, social political essays about the comics industry and yada, 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 all that stuff. So, just Star Trek stuff on there as well, isn't there? Oh, yeah, there's a ton of Star Trek stuff, yes. yes there's a ton of Star Trek stuff, there's some G.I. Joe stuff, there's Star Wars stuff. Check it out. Cool. And uh, I'll throw links up for that on the news post for this if you are listening to the audio version. If you are watching the video version, that will have popped up quite nicely along the bottom of the screen um, for you to um, copy and uh, awesome. pop across to. Um. You know I hate doing these, Adam, so you can do them. What's ours? Uh, if you'd like to visit our website, it's www.avpgalaxy.net, and there we have a resource of information regarding the franchises as well as message boards if you'd like to engage in discussion with other fans. You can also find us on all the major social channels, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. If you search AVP Galaxy or Alien vs. Predator Galaxy, you're sure to find us. 
Uh, if you'd like to follow me personally, it's at Ridgetop21 at both Instagram and Twitter. And I'm also followable on Twitter at underscore Corporal Hicks. And that's Alien, Predator, Halo, Stargate, Star Trek, Airsoft, all manner of nerdy bollocks that I'm um, passionate about. So thank you, everybody, for listening or watching. Uh, this has been Aaron Percival. Adam Zeller. And Andrew E. C. Gaska signing off.